Now I'd like to introduce our, our speaker today, who's going to, uh, Dr Thomas Wilkins, who's going to speak on assessing Australia's bargaining power in the US alliance at a time of regional power shift, looking at assets versus liabilities. Uh, Dr Wilkins, Senior Lecturer in International Security at City University, and Senior Visiting Fellow at Japan Institute of International Affairs. He received his PhD from the University of Birmingham in the UK, completed his postdoctoral studies at the University of San Francisco and East West Centre Honolulu. He's been the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the Taiwan Fellow at the Taiwan National University, the Japan Foundation and the Japanese Studies Fellow, the Japanese Society for Promotion of Science and Research Fellow, both at the University of Tokyo and Visiting Associate Professor at the University of Hong Kong and at Keio University. And you're going to say to me, what university has he been at? <laughs> he certainly had a very wide experience. He specialised in security issues in Asia Pacific region and has published in the Review of International Studies, the International Relations of the Asia Pacific and Australian Journal of International Affairs, and his 2019 book, Security in Asia Pacific, The Dynamics of Alignment, uh, was, was published earlier this year. He's also an associate editor for the journal Pacific Affairs and the area editor for Japanese Studies. So would you please welcome to the podium, uh, Dr. Thomas Walker. Well, uh, thank you, General, for that um, extremely kind introduction, and sorry for giving you so many tongue-twisting <laughs> appointments <laughs> and titles. Um, well, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here today. Um, thank you uh, for, for Ken uh, to, uh, for uh, reaching out to me. Um, and uh, you know, give me this opportunity to share some of my latest research work uh, with you. So, um, I know that about uh, a year ago you had uh, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Curran, uh, come to speak to you on a, a quite a similar topic, uh, a topic. I saw that on the, uh, the podcast um, uh, on the, the website. And uh, so some of what I'm going to talk about today actually follows on uh, a little bit uh, from that, but sort of takes a, a slightly different uh, perspective. So. The way I'm going to approach today's uh, talk, there's much, um, you know, uh, much discussion of this concept of uh, hybrid warfare. Well, this is going to be a sort of a hybrid presentation because uh, I've got some PowerPoint slides, um, but I've also um, got a paper which I'll refer to um, in the middle uh, and read some of that out to you. So I shall try to speak to my time over 45 minutes. Uh, so somebody please give me a warning if I start to trespass on that. Um, the, um, the title uh, was uh, Assessing Australia's Bargaining Power in the, uh, the, the US Alliance at a time of regional power shift, um, but also in a, a, a time of political transition uh, with uh, the advent of the Donald Trump administration has clearly, clearly created um, a number of challenges for the Anxious Alliance going forward. So I'm going to look at uh, as much uh, at, uh, at uh, that aspect as well as the sort of structural power shifts that are going on in the background uh, with the rise of China and the rise of decline of the United States. Um, could I have the next slide, please, uh, General? Thank you. So, just to give you a little bit of background um, on, on this. Uh, so, uh, I've been uh, engaged by the Sasakawa uh, Peace Foundation uh, in Japan, one of Japan's uh, think tanks, uh, to uh, work on this project, uh, US Allies uh, Balance Sheet. And so, this was kind of the, the genesis for uh, the, the paper and the talk that I'm giving today. Um, but prior to that, I, I uh, wrote my PhD on alliances and coalition warfare, which is why I got into this topic of looking at uh, alliance relations, alignment dynamics, and so forth, uh, which you, you can see in the, the latest book. And uh, well, I've just um, provided the, the library here with a, with a copy of this book, so you're uh, more than welcome to refer to that um, if the inclination uh, strikes you. Now, um, I've been working on this, this topic of the, the changing nature of alliances and alignment in the Indo-Pacific, and I've written you know, a number of things on this. And uh, my argument is that you know, these um, traditional alliances that were created during the Cold War, like NATO, the US alliance with uh, Japan and Korea, and also the ANZUS alliance, are uh, being kind of transformed from within and from, um, from without. And a whole new um, range of new security alignments are also developing, which I'll shed a bit of light on in this talk as well. Um, so, 
so uh, mostly uh, 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 the general has already provided you with uh, some of my professional background, but uh, you know, I spent time in the United States um, and obviously in Australia uh, and, uh, and also Japan more recently. Um, so those are the kind of the areas that I'm, that I'm interested in. Uh, could the next slide, please? Okay. So um, this is the plan for, um, for today's uh, talk. So. Um, Firstly, I'll uh, just give a bit of an uh, introduction and set the, the context for um, the, uh, the discussion of the, uh, the Australia-US alliance. Um, then the main talk has kind of two parts, which is based upon the structure of the article that I'm writing for the journal um, Security Challenges, and a version of which I hope to, uh, to contribute to the, the Rusi journal as well. So the first part is to um, look at um, the, uh, the Australia-US alliance. Uh, we could say ANSYS, but since New Zealand was sort of excluded from, from ANSYS in the, um, in the 1980s, it's very much become a bilateral um, arrangement uh, de facto. So the idea is to apply a, a ledger or a balance sheet framework to, um, to, uh, to analyse the strengths and weaknesses or the assets and liabilities that Australia holds in dealing with its superpower US ally. So that's the first part, we'll look at that and we'll look at the, look at the ledger. And then the second part is um, to see how um, this uh, ledger has been forced to change under the Trump administration, uh, which has a very, very different approach to alliances. Um, and also, um, in, with the background context of the regional power shift that's uh, underway with the rise of China and the relative decline of the United States. Um, and then I'll just finish up with some conclusions and implications going forward. Uh, can I the next slide, please? Okay, so, uh, you know, you, I don't need to tell you about the, the background of ANSYS, you're all familiar with that, but uh, yeah, uh, the original purpose of ANSYS was aimed at a research in Japan and then later shifted to a, um, you know, an alliance that was aimed at uh, limiting the spread of um, Soviet or Chinese-inspired communism, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, but after the Cold War, um, the alliance essentially became threatless after the Soviet Union imploded. You know, the major strategic threat for the alliance was, um, was eliminated. Um, that was um, fairly rapidly afterwards replaced by um, the, the war on terror and uh, you know, a, a focus on um, you know, Islamic terrorist organizations, uh, Al-Qaeda and so forth. But more recently there's been talk of this, you know, the, the purpose of the alliance shifting towards um, uh, countering um, the rise of China. Um, if not so specifically, rather casting um, the, the purpose of the alliance as um, upholding the rules-based international order. Um, a, uh, a, an alliance that champions a certain set of values, uh, democracy, international law, free trade, human rights, and so forth. Um, so this is now sort of a, not an alliance that is, that is negative and against something, but rather an alliance that is a sort of for a positive set of values, which, of course, um, some other countries within the region that are gaining in, in strength and assertiveness don't necessarily share. Um, and so you can very much see this under you may have this uh, this buzzword free and open Indo-Pacific. This is the kind of the, the policy framework or scaffolding um, for the um, should we say the, um, the, the alliance's um, primary activities. Um, in 2017, uh, the Australian Foreign Policy White Paper was um, released. Um, and this basically committed Australia more than ever to its alliance relationship with the United States, um, doubling down in the words of Peter Jennings and other um, strategic commentators. So um, Australia would increase its contribution to the alliance, would up its defence spending, um, and uh, increase its integration and interoperability um, with, uh, with the, the US alliance. And, deepen its reliance upon the alliance for, uh, for its uh, national security and, and defence. Um, at the same time, uh, Australia has um, complemented the, uh, the bilateral alliance relationship with um, the United States with a closer special strategic partnership with Japan, another key US ally. 
And arguably, I would say that both Canberra and Tokyo are now perhaps the what might be deemed core allies within the US alliance system, um, cooperating with an intensity and an enthusiasm um, that you simply don't see among perhaps Thailand or South Korea, um, which are now becoming more peripheral um, to the, the, the US um, strategic presence in the Asia Pacific. So um, Australia and Japan have, um, have, uh, have created their own bilateral security alignment, not, not specifically an alliance, but a very, very close security relationship, which is quite a, a revolution for, for both countries. Um, and then they triangulate this, again, through the trilateral strategic dialogue um, with the United States, as I said, building this kind of trilateral core at the center of the US hub and spoke system. And this has led commentators to start um, advocating for a more formalized alliance with uh, Japan. But there's, there's a number of issues to that, which we can perhaps go into later if anyone wants to come back to it. So even at the time that the US alliance system, the hub and spoke system, or San Francisco system, is um, under duress, both from within, because of the presidency of Donald Trump, and his uh, treatment and perception of uh, traditional U.S. allies. And from, out, from without, from a, uh, a rise in China, um, this gives, uh, this puts um, Canberra in a difficult predicament, as it does other U.S. allies. So this was a kind of a, a motivator for, for carrying out this study. And of course, you know, as uh, people uh, like uh, Professor uh, Curran uh, have uh, you know, I've talked to you before about this, you know, the, uh, the whole um, US alliance uh, relationship in Australia is under intense scrutiny and debate. And we've got a number of high profile critics of the US alliance that argue for, you know, uh, for uh, sort of uh, moving away from, uh, from a Washington led by Donald Trump and towards more accommodation with China in some instances, um, such as the late Malcolm Fraser, um, and uh, Bob Carr, uh, Gareth Evans, uh, and you know, Hugh White, and his, uh, you know, his uh, famous argument about the, the, the China choice. And uh, a lot of these debates have been going on, um, especially within the, uh, the confines of uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the strategic community, um, blogging community, uh, the lobby interpreter, and the SD um, strategist, and so forth. So that's the background. So it's the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the core of my, uh, my argument, which is um, not to do um, a cost-benefit analysis of the value of the US alliance to Australia, which has typically been the way, let's look at the US alliance, you know, what does Australia get out of it, what are the plus points, what are the minus points, you know, and inevitably conclude that even if there's a few downsides, that the US alliance is crucial to Australia's national security. So that's all been done before, and it's pretty much um, woven into a lot of the debates uh, around this topic. But rather, what I wanted to do was to look at um, how we could measure Canberra's strengths and weaknesses, what I call its assets and liabilities, um, in its intra-alliance bargaining with the United States. Um, that is, you know, if um, Canberra um, finds itself in a uh, what we call a, a bargaining encounter, um, a, uh, an instance where uh, Australia wants to you know, assert a certain position or a certain policy, um, or, you know, or respond to an American one. Um, you know, what is it? Um, what are the the, you know, the, the the props of its ability to influence um, U.S. policies and uh, police policies um, in these bargaining encounters? What are the, you know, the What's the scorecard of you know what Australia can put forward and the things that Australia needs to um, sort of um, have have in mind in terms of uh, protecting some of its liabilities? Um, so uh, it's um, originally aimed as a as a policy relevant analysis from which policy recommendations or prescriptions could be drawn um, and to assist Canberra in defending and advancing its national interests. Um, not only through the alliance mechanism, but within the alliance itself. So, I suppose the, um, you know, the implicit question on, um, of, of this is also, 
you know, what is the United States value in Australia? You know, one of the things that when Washington looks at Australia, they think, ah, yes, you know, you can do these various things for us, or you know, this is a you know a strong point. Um, and how can Canberra exploit this? So basically, we just sort of um, create a uh, column of, of assets and, and liabilities. I'll employ you with the sort of the, the theoretical underpinnings of this uh, from the international relations literature, um, but uh, rather just the, the, the output of the, 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 uh, the, the balance uh, sheet or, or ledger of, of assets and liability. Um, this, and uh, you know, there's a good, a good reason to try and keep this simple and just simply put it in these columns of assets and liabilities. Um, but uh, one of the problems with this is uh, a lot of people ask me, well, can you, can you rank these in order of significance? You know, what are the strongest assets? What are the weakest assets? What are the worst liabilities? What are the, you know, the more limited liabilities? Um, there's a few problems in that because um, actually, as you'll see on the, on the, the table um, to follow, that um, a lot of these, what I've identified as assets and liabilities in sort of separate compartments, they're actually sort of interconnected with one another, or they sort of they have to balance one another out or something, or there could be situational. So in you know, one context, this asset may be particularly powerful, in another, um, not so useful. Um, so that, that's a, a little bit of a difficulty that we need to bear in mind. Uh, thank you. Okay, so this is the, um, the, this is the what should we call this, the, uh, the standard, or the, the, the basic ledger of, um, of Australia's uh, bargaining. Um, so, you know, if we, you know, if I asked you, could you take a little note down and say, you know, what are the strong points that Australia has? You know, what are the things that, are, that, that the US values? These are the sort of things that you that, that you, you might come up with. At least this is what I came up with in discussion with other colleagues. Um, I'm happy to hear, um, you know, any um, uh, comments or additions or, or uh, and so forth um, in the Q and A. So. I'll try and um, I just want to be a bit cautious about my um, about my time, uh, but I think I have time just to sort of sketch in a little bit on on, on these and, and tell you what I mean by these because uh, you know they're simply um, one word or several word headings. So I'll go through the assets just briefly to sort of conjure up what I what I mean by loyalty. So by loyalty, I mean an unbroken. Um, uh, record of, uh, of military and diplomatic support for Washington. Um, so uh, uh, Australia has fought alongside the United States in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq a couple of times, the war on terror and so forth. So Australia is seen by the United States as an ally that is willing to pay the blood, the pay the blood price. Um, it's a reliable partner. It's also has a reputation as a good international citizen. So getting Australia to support your positions um, uh, you know, can bestow international legitimacy, um, for example, on United States actions. So that's what I mean by loyalty or, or track record. And, and this is something that, you know, that, Aus that, that Australian um, politicians and diplomats have invested an enormous amount into this asset um, and consider it to be perhaps one of the, the strongest assets that Australia has. And we'll see how this might change under Trump administration. Secondly is Australia's military contribution. Australia may only be a middle power, but it has um, you know, small but high-end um, uh, military forces, RNA capable military forces, expeditionary orientated, highly interoperable with the United States, and so um, the ADF is an extremely valuable uh, and capable coalition partner for the United States, something that they um, also um, highly value. Also, of course, we have a number of joint facilities, most notably um, the Joint Defence uh, Facility uh, Pine Gap, uh, but also now, more recently, hosting rotational presence of the US Marine Air Ground Task Force uh, in the Northern Territory. So these are also things that the United States um, values that Australia you know, can bring to the table when it bargains um, with uh, Washington. Thirdly, um, defence and economic um, collaboration. So Australia is obviously a uh, major customer for US <coughs> military hardware. Um, you know, got the uh, Abrams battle tank, um, F-18s, um, and of course more recently the Joint Strike Fighter, um, and a whole bunch of uh, other systems or uh, platforms that Australia is investing in. <coughs> so 
the fact that Australia, according to some calculations, 60% of its defence acquisitions are sourced from the United States, and Australia spends 13 million Australian dollars per working day with US defence industries, um, that should give them a little bit of leverage amongst, uh, you know, on these, these major um, defence um, uh, corporations in the United States, which of course should translate into lobbying and influence on Capitol Hill. Um, just as a little addendum to that, <coughs> the um, aspect of economic cooperation is something that um, under um, uh, under uh, Prime Minister Howard and the, the, the bilateral free trade agreement was something that was supposed to be you know, sort of expanding the, the bases of the alliance um, was a, another important aspect to this and uh, you know, there's a lot of commentators in the United States that want to see more economic cooperation or penetration in Australia uh, by uh, you know, American um, uh, businesses. Okay, number four, regional networking. Um, this is something that uh, Australia has um, taken uh, upon itself in terms of uh, assisting the United States in joining up or networking the individual spokes of its hub and spoke system, uh, like Japan but others, and helping to, to build these into more of a, more of a, a network or connect uh, the, the spokes. So just to align upon Japan, which is the most important of these, the Joint Security, um, the Joint Declaration of Security Cooperation in 2007 built this um, strategic partnership between Australia and Japan, and this was very much done with the blessing of Washington. It wants its spokes, its individual isolated um, uh, bilateral allies, to cooperate more, to buttress the American alliance system as it faces challenges. And again, you see this through the trilateral strategic dialogue. Less formally, you also see Australia playing an important role in Southeast Asia in terms of network working with ASEAN countries and through the Five Power Defence Arrangement, for example. Uh, in 2018, we had the um, Australia ASEAN Special Summit meeting. These are all things that you, know, you could perhaps argue you know, that, um, that Australia puts forth some American positions or American favourable positions forward by, by proxy. So, the networking aspect. Um, okay, fifthly, um, convergent threat perceptions. During the Cold War, and right up to the War on Terror, Australia and the United States um, have had very much um, symmetrical uh, perceptions of, of, of threat. Um, uh, and uh, even in a period where um, Sort of, uh, after the Cold War, you know, a major strategic threat disappeared. Um, there was still an Australian commitment to upholding American primacy um, and upholding a regional order with the United States at the centre of it. But more recently, this, um, you know, there's been a bit of a, a, bit of a shift in terms of you know, how the alliance behaves. So, as I said at the, uh, the beginning, it's more now an advocate for a certain type of regional order, a rules-based international order, and therefore would re resist challenges to that order, such as North Korea, Russia, or China, um, and other disruptive state or non-state um, actors. Okay, quickly, number, number six. Um, ideological or domestic um, compatibility. So, um, every time you look at uh, relations between the US and Australia, you look at the sort of, uh, you know, the compatibility of their domestic political systems, uh, Anglo-Saxon dominated cultures, um, and uh, all of the, you know, the, the deep people-to-people -people linkages and connections between military, public, um, politicians, um, and specific alliance managers, either based in Australia or the United States, um, and uh, the strong domestic support that, uh, that uh, the alliance enjoys um, in Australia should be a strength as well as obviously bipartisan political support. Right. So this is the, the plus side of, of the ledger. These are all the, all the, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the advantages that Australia can leverage when it bargains for the United States, particularly speaking. And just quickly to go over the liabilities. Um, so, of course, the big problem is that the United States is 
a superpower and Australia is a middle power. To the United States, Australia is a small ally. Right? So, um, the, 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 um, the, the disparity in aggregate power, in economic power, military power, and so forth, and global power um, is, is striking. So, how does a, a small ally you know, manage to make itself heard um, um, in the corridors of power in a superpower ally that has, has many allies and relationships? Well, not only is there you know, a material disparity in you know, the, the relative strength of powers, you know, normally if the powers were relatively equal, they would supposedly have relatively equal bargaining power, but that's not the case in Australia, uh, Australia and the United States. Um, this is actually made worse by a couple of things, because Australia doesn't enjoy an unequivocal security guarantee from the United States, uh, like that Article 5 of NATO. The ANZUS Treaty, as I'm sure you're all well aware, uses much more, um, we say, uh, understated languages and sold to meet the common danger or, or something um, similar. And so, you know, Australia always fears they might be abandoned by the United States. And so this perhaps um, creates a tendency to, towards a, a more um, supplicant position towards the United States. Um, reinforcing that power asymmetry as well is the absence of a formal infrastructure of alliance. So other than the ANZUS Treaty itself and the bilateral Bosnian um, um, consultations, annual <laughs> consultations, um, there's no kind of you know, central command, joint headquarters like NATO, um, and uh, you know, no no actual formalised alliance structure within which the relationship can occur. And we'll see why this is becoming an increasing problem. Okay, lastly, uh, sorry, secondly, um, path um, dependency and some costs. Well, um, because of what um, Professor Curran talked about in, in his own speech about this sort of sentimentalism towards the United States, um, in Australia, um, the need to uh, pay the premium of the alliance uh, as an insurance policy, um, then you know, uh, Washington, Washington can often take um, Australia for granted. Uh, just assume, well, you've always said yes in the past, we can't conceive of you saying no in the future. And so this actually um, means that Australia foregoes some of its uh, potential negotiating power. Also, of course, um, you know, as well as the fact that Australia is so dependent upon um, the United States and locked in to the um, US military industrial complex, um, uh, it also um, uh, also you know, creates some, some risks for Australia um, because of this sort of inseparability uh, from the US alliance that um, it could be trapped in future conflicts um, that the US is involved in or initiates that are not necessarily in its national interests. So this is the sort of, you know, the, the dependent ally argument. Then lastly, of course, this is something that has just come to sharper and sharper relief um, over the last uh, decade or so, is the way that Australia um, is in a situation of what we call complex economic interdependence with China. So, because of its economic interests and the fact that economics are being seen increasingly as a measure of national power, more or less on a par with, with military power these days, um, geoeconomics, economic statecraft, um, we now have to worry about um, whether you know, things, actions that we might take to support the United States, um, how Beijing will respond to these, and the threat of economic coercion. Um, so, if um, the United States, if Australia wants to give you know, unqualified support to the United States for various actions, particularly on issues that are sensitive to, to China, um, then it needs to think twice about you know, how this will affect its relationship with its biggest trading partner. So, that's the standard lecture. So, I'm probably not telling you things that are, that are new, but perhaps uh, just you know, structuring them in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a new way, offering a fresh perspective. Yeah. So, um, the big question is, um, you know, we've, we've had these, uh, you know, this, this traditional, or this original or conventional ledger in our minds um, as sort of, uh, you know, um, durable assumptions um, up till now. But under Trump and under, you know, the, in, 
increased effects of the structural power shift um, things are changing. So, in terms of the Trump presidency, the American first policies um, that he's enunciated are generally harmful to Australian interests, protectionism, withdrawal from the TPP, uh, withdrawal from the Iran deal, Harrison, you know, the list goes on, right? But none of these are actually beneficial, really, to Australia. Most are harmful in the sense that, you know, they undermine the liberal international order um, on which Australia depends for its overall um, kind of security and prosperity. Um, and of course, even worse, Trump has castigated allies and um, called US security guarantees into question, which has created you know, a sense of panic in Canberra, Tokyo, and other allies as to whether or not the United States is still a, a credible um, security guarantor. So, um, this has created some, you know, uh, a lot of uh, uh, a need for uh, kind of new thinking in relation to uh, alliance management. And then, in the background to this sort of, uh, she said, you know, these storms on the on, on the surface uh, that, that Trump has created, um, then you know we're seeing an increasing structural uh, power shift as the U.S. retrenches, the end of the rebalance to the Indo-Pacific. Um, and China's power and influence, military power and so forth, um, keep rising. And of course, these debates are widely covered by people like Hugh White and, and others in his uh, recent um, quarterly essay, um, Asia Without America. Um, so basically, this is the worst of both worlds for US allies like Australia. We now have an ally that we really need to depend upon, but we're not sure if we can. That ally, ally is also um, relatively declining, at the same time, we have to face a very powerful trading partner that doesn't share the same um, international rules of the road, the liberal international order um, that we um, wish to adhere to. So this is a bad timing. So um, now I'll just spend the, uh, the, the last part of the, um, uh, of the presentation um, telling you uh, a little bit about how I think this, uh, you know, this standard ledger has been transformed. Uh, because of the Trump issue and the, and the China structural trend. So, uh, so loyalty, perhaps our foremost asset, traditionally speaking, you know, up, to, up till now, um, I think that has become weaker under Trump. I don't think it really counts um, much in Trump's mind, depending on how much he's actually aware of Australia. Apparently, you know, he's supposedly educated or briefed on, on how much of a loyal ally Australia was, but I haven't really sort of seen any massive kind of um, validation of that from him. I mean, where um, Turnbull would sort of grovel that we were joined at the hip with, uh, with the Americans, he didn't get much back in return in terms of sort of equal um, uh, sort of uh, gushing rhetoric. Um, military contribution, I think, this may be more important under Trump because, uh, and the, you know, the regional strategic environment we face, because um, you know, we're increasing our defense budget to 2%. That keeps Trump happy, right? That is the NATO benchmark, and that's what he's been arguing for. So we're doing our bit there. We're bulletproof, uh, if you're pardon the expression, from being criticized by, by Donald Trump um, for not doing enough for our own defense. Yeah, and, uh, uh, but, um, yeah, and then uh, yeah, this, this goes on to defence and economic collaboration. Again, we're spending most of the money that we've, spent, that we've allocated to defence acquisitions with US companies. Again, you know, Trump is looking at this as how can we extract you know, um, economic benefit from our allies, from our partners. And so again, this would seem to satisfy him. Um, now, regional networking has also become much more important, especially with this that advent of this concept of the Indo-Pacific, the idea that Australia is at the crossroads of these two great oceans, um, and that this is the kind of the, the geopolitical pivot point of, of the region now. Um, so, um, so uh, actions such as the um, you know, participation in the quadrilateral strategic dialogue, or the Quad, uh, alongside the, uh, the, the, the trilateral strategic dialogue, are very much welcomed by, um, you know, by uh, policy planners in the United States, and, uh, you know, and, and 
front has obviously endorsed it, um, uh, endorsed the, the, the Quad and the Free and Open Indo Pacific. But for you know, for those that really you know do the do the strategic planning uh, within the you know the, the State Department and the, and the military and so forth, Australia's geographic location has become um, never so important as in during the Second World War. Um, uh, and the, uh, you know, the American presence in Australia has also become more valuable as a way that the United States can you know, train its forces for interoperability in the Northern Territories, in Northern Territories with, uh, with Australia, but also use this as a, a perch um, from which to uh, sort of um, surveil the, the junction of the, the Indo-Pacific and also um, to informally engage with Southeast Asian and South Pacific partners as well. Uh, and again, uh, you know, as a sub-region of the Indo-Pacific, the South Pacific has become increasingly important. We've had the Pacific step up, and you know, Americans, um, you know, I was uh, talking to an American official uh, the other week, and they were saying they're much, much more interested in the South Pacific um, now that we've seen you know, moves towards an extension of Chinese influence there. So what Australia can do by itself, with the United States, with Japan, um, you know, but towards the objectives of the United States, common allied objectives, these things have really, really grown in, in, in importance. Um, in terms of um, con conversion threat perceptions, um, this is a little more tricky to determine. So, uh, sort of a mi mixed, pi mixed uh, picture here. Um, the, um, the United States advocated a more confrontational approach to China under the, uh, the Penn speech that was given at the Post Institute a while back. Um, and the uh, uh, national security strategy or national defense strategy um, declares that you know, US allies um, must demonstrate the will to confront shared, shared threat. So that means the United States expects um, Australia to endorse its ideas of what's a threat in the region. Um, but you know, Australia is a little more ambivalent about you know, playing China as a, as a threat, um, and there's a lot of kind of you know, discussions internally within Australia and you can see the newspapers all the time about you know whether there is really a threat and how to deal with it and so forth. So Australia is a bit ambivalent about this. Of course, it hasn't agreed to um, to join the United States in uh, freedom navigation operations within the 12 mile uh, multiple mile exclusion zone of Chinese uh, features in the South China Sea, which gives you a, you know, a, a sort of perhaps a little bit of an indicator of, of how far. Australia is uh, prepared to go. Um, in terms of um, ideological or domestic compatibility, um, I'd say this is seriously taking a hit. The America First policies of the Trump administration really kind of disrupt um, this heretofore important asset. Um, it disturbs the core values that are at the heart of, um, of ANZUS um, and the departure of American stewardship from the, 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 the liberal world order. This has harmed Australia badly. It's very difficult to show your value as a good international citizen to an administration that is basically you know, not endorsing or, you know, or, or even you know, walking away from that problem and is a bad international citizen even. Um, and you know, a lot of these policies are harmful to the to the US, and it's very, very difficult to deal with a president like Trump. We think of the fractious phone conversation upon, with uh, Malcolm Turnbull, on which the uh, the, you know, the the uh, relationship got off to a, a terrible start, um, and uh, so we can see there's there's some problems there. Okay. Um, and by the way, these um, you know these uh, these you know, negative effect, positive effect, or, or uh, you know largely unaffected. Um, it's more complex than just a simple up or down. I mean, you have to sort of unpack some of these things. And you know, so this talk I can I can do here to, um, with that today. So power asymmetry um, probably hasn't changed um, that much. Um, you know, the um, the president of the United States looks at alliance relations purely in transactional or material terms. Um, you know, one of the things I think the, uh, the lack of alliance institutions and infrastructure has really revealed that depending upon personal, you know, head of, um, you know, head of government to head of government uh, relationships, um, which work very well under you know, Howard and Bush and under uh, you know, Bernard and Obama, um, we can see the problem with this now because we, we don't have fabulous relations between the, uh, you know, the two premiers. 
uh, and, uh, you know, and premiers of allied capitals have had to start to learn how to, you know, to, to manage Trump. This is a, a new skill um, that you sort of quarantine or you have to persuade or something. Um, so this is really thrown back um, the, um, you know, should we say the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the locus of allied interaction upon working level connections as opposed to um, you know, uh, head of government to government um, relations. So Australia has now said, so, well, you know, it's difficult to talk to, you know, uh, to, to Trump, uh, you know, and to, you know, to get our points across, and Trump will appreciate this. So we need to step down. We need to go down to, you know, more able and more stable elements of the deep state. Um, so we're looking at, you know, uh, the U.S. bureaucracy, the State Department, Congress members, military defense, intelligence organizations, think tanks, alliance managers. Um, among whom, of course, the Australian alliance remains highly valued and uh, supported. So, it's sort of a little bit of hope in the, the, the 2018 national defence strategy that, you know, that uh, I think Mattis obviously had a hand in this and said, you know, alliances are incredibly important. So, now we've got a situation where we have to bypass Trump in order to manage the alliance. Um, so the second point is um, we further deepen our sunk costs into the alliance, uh, thereby deepening this um, liability. Um, Australia really just doesn't have anywhere else to go um, than the alliance uh, with the United States in terms of its national security, in terms of its national defence. That's of course we want to double or triple our defence budget. Um, so Paul Bibb says, you know, we have no credible defence future without the US alliance. So we're basically, um, you know, we're, we're entirely dependent upon this. We've, we've sunk everything into it and our options are limited. And then uh, lastly, this uh, problem of complex um, e um, economic interdependence um, has only got more problematic. And Australia, you can see some instances of Australia deviating from its overall support with it, um, to the United States through joining the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and um, you know, releasing um, uh, Dar Darwin's commercial port um, to a Chinese contractor. Um, so, you know, we've, we've seen that Australia is prepared to do things in its economic interest that its you know, strategic ally is not necessarily highly supportive of. On the other hand, of course, um, this has been disrupted by the more recent revelations of yeah. Chinese sharp power against Australia and influence operations, which have given Canberra a rethink about uh, you know, the desirability of, uh, of getting too closely integrated economically with China. And so you know, we saw the, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 the uh, prohibition of, uh, you know, of, um, uh, of um, Chinese um, <coughs> Uh, telecom suppliers like Huawei and the ZTE in supplying um, Australia's 5G networks, for example. So that's that's also kind of a, a little bit of a mixed picture, but but you know maybe um, you know a deepening liability as well. So um, assets are outnumbered by the so these are the loose that rank up numerically six to three, right? Um, but you know, as I said right at the start, it's very difficult to actually sort of uh, weight um, these individual um, categories and say, well, this one is stronger or this one is weaker. Um, so, you know, in reality, the assets and the liabilities are all interconnected and interactive and also contextual. contextual. So is it possible to definitively to measure these? You know, so they have to be a sort of a, you know, a, a mind map as opposed to, you know, very much a scientific, you know, um, uh, kind of a, um, result. Um, traditional assets um, such as loyalty and ideological domestic compat uh, compatibility have been seriously weakened under Trump. He places a higher premium on military and economic values, um, and uh, you know, on what the, the US can actually extract from ANZUS. You know, wants to get some get something back. Threat perception is more ambivalent. Um, so US primacy in regional order um, competes with the notion of complex economic independence, but then that's undermined by the use of sharp power. Um, so so the, you know, the, the common threat perceptions are, are a little bit sort of muddy or murky, especially in comparison to the Cold War, where these things were virtually you know, a given that there was complete agreement. Um, also, it's worth noting that you know, um, when, um, you know, when it comes to um, supporting the United States, it clashes with, with China. Um, the costs 
are going to be much higher and much more risky for Australia than say when Australia said, okay, you're going to invade Iraq, all right, we can, you know, we can contribute something to that. You know, um, you know, that's a completely different scenario to joining the United States you know, in a conflict um, you know, around the Thailand Strait, for example. I mean, that's, you know, that, that's a much more serious um, scenario. And then lastly, the lack of alliance infrastructure and the dependence on the personal executive level relations has become a major liability under Trump because we just haven't got this level of uh, bonhomie and, and so forth and mateship that we've, we've seen between uh, previous um, uh, Premier Diane's in the past. Yeah, uh, last one, please. So what are the implications going forward from your something out of this analysis? Well, some people have said, well, all we need to do is survive the four-year Trump um, abomination and hope things return to normality. Um, and, you know, this would mean that the, the, um, you know, the ledger that I presented originally, you know, becomes more re-established, we return to something more closely approximating that, right? Um, in the meantime, we just sort of bypass Trump and we reinforce our relations with the deep state and perpetuate you know, the good relationships, structural relationships that we always had and that we can return to that will start functioning properly under a new premier. Um, and we continue to maintain the US um, strategic position in Asia even if Trump isn't supporting it, who we will, you know, we are all, you know, only partially supporting it. So, you know, we collaborate more with Japan and so forth to, you know, to uphold the rules-based order even if the United States is partially able. Um, and, uh, you know, and we also need to cooperate with Japan as well just to, to, to spread our liabilities and to diversify our options, you know. We need to come up with our plan B. Secondly, we might need to think, well, what if Trump becomes the new, new normal, right? either by a second term um, or the victory of uh, you know, another populist or similar type president to, to Trump, we'll have to completely rethink that the old ledger you know, is, you know, is going to be left behind and the great adjusting new ledger is going to become the new facts of life. And we'll have to start getting used to paying much more in terms of defence costs and contributions going forward to, you know, to service those, you know, the new prioritising of, of assets. And then lastly, you know, one of the things uh, I think we need to do is to overhaul uh, the alliance structure. Um, we need to somehow um, fabricate a stronger alliance infrastructure, formalisation, so that it can be better insulated against dependency upon problematic presidencies and personal relationships. Okay, uh, final slide please. So, thank you very much indeed for your attention and uh, look forward to all of your questions um, and you know, any suggestions for um, improvement or adjustment. Thank you very much indeed.